Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us, Art Basel Conversations. And um, this is a very special talk. Um, Nedko Solikov, an artist from, from Sofia, in conversation with Johnny Jetzer, who is uh, not only the curator of Art Basel's unlimited sector, but he's also a correct curator at large at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC. We're very grateful that both of you could take time from your busy schedule to do this talk with us. Um, please join us in giving them a warm uh, round of applause. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you, Netko, for being here. I mean, Netko Solokov for the invitation. is one of the approximately 50 artists who came to Basel to install that piece. And I think I always take it as a compliment for what we are doing, that the artists take time and care to show up here and to optimize the presentation until the very last moment. It's kind of physical work until almost the last minute. And it has been a great success. I Miss Socialism, maybe, is a core piece of the exhibition. And it's also a very important piece in the oeuvre of the artist. And uh, we're going to have the chance. I mean, I know that you are here to hear the artist talk. And that's what we're going to do. But we're going to try to get deeper into the context of history and how artists use history and how artists fictionalize history within their work. I wanted to concentrate on artists that are related to socialism, I mean, for obvious reason, and to create a connection with the work by Netco that is in the show. And I just wanted to start my presentation with this painting by Chen Yaning. You might have encountered it or seen it in a show. It's because it's part also of the SICK collection. So it's traveling, it has traveled to several museums worldwide. And it's one of the iconic piece of late social realism. So the official, um, one of the official socialist art style that was taught at the academy, at the National Academy in Beijing, not so far from Tiananmen Square. And of course, if you look at the painting, it doesn't seem to be so uh, kind of unknown from its composition. For example, it's, it's built up on a triangular composition. There are many, many examples in, in the painting from classicism to this day that rely on this principle of composition. And in the middle, you have, of course, Mao Zedong. He inspects the Guangdong countryside. The inspection goes back, or like this moment where the emperor, or basically the leader or the ruler, inspects a certain con construction work, is, goes back to the 17th century, where we know uh, the oldest depiction of uh, rulers actually inspecting a certain built edifice. So this painting from 1972 has, of course, gigantic dimensions. And it was part of the painting style in the 1970s in China. It's interesting to see Yu Hong, who actually is part of both realities. So she went to this National Academy of Fine Arts and studied oil painting for many years, acquired an incredible expertise, but eventually uh, lost social realism as the, the one and only artistic style that was accepted and promoted in China. So it's really interesting if you look again at the composition, uh, remember the triangle, there's no such thing here. And I think it's, it's really one of the key elements of this painting is that she uses the lack of this ideal form to show the new forces in society the painting's title, Old Man Yu Gong is Still Moving Away, goes back to a Chinese saying that was uh, also used by Mao Zedong in one of his speeches prominently. And it says uh, basically that uh, humans can uh, dominate nature or they can elevate themselves above nature through their will. 
So actually, even this old man can move mountains by his will and by his ability to organize people around him, working with him to achieve his goal. If you look here, the, the people at the bottom actually are working hard, pushing against this, this rock facade, the rock face of the mountain, while towards the top, uh, like the individuals depicted on the top seem to be much more uh, lonely, uh, living within their own world, their own dreams, their own visions. I think there are at least three smartphones that you can detect. I mean, the most obvious one is on the top right corner. This young boy taking a selfie at the very top, kind of a dangerous endeavor. There are many examples of people who, who died even taking selfies uh, close to cliffs. But it shows eventually that the society has been exploded and has been replaced by individual dreams and individual visions. Another example in the show that I think is very interesting from a Chinese artist who is born in 1986, He Changju, and he lives in Berlin. Also kind of a new phenomenon that uh, young Chinese contemporary artists move to Europe and uh, use uh, European bases to produce their work. This work, entitled 2018, consists of four elements. There are three photographs on the walls. This is a detail shot with a, a, a pencil line that is drawn on the wall, which indicates the, the body height of uh, He Shanju when he was a boy. This is a photograph uh, that was taken when he was 12 on Tiananmen Square. And he visited with his parents. I asked him if he was aware of the tragic incidents that happened on the square eight years before. And he said, no, actually, that came much later. When I went to college, I learned about it. And uh, that's when I, I, I became aware. But it's very really interesting to see this Tiananmen Square, the geometric uh, structure of the tiles, and basically the solitude of this child standing. It has, of course, to do with the, with the one-child policy that was still in place when the artist was raised in China, and the impossibility uh, to make the experience to have siblings and to be raised in a, in a family with siblings and more than just one child. So on one hand, this square is kind of a golden nest with all the privileges of the chosen one, on the other hand, it's also uh, this grid, this system, and the system that basically forces the individual into a position of loneliness. Maybe a second piece that is in the, in the SIG collection, uh, also by He Zhu, the tank project. Probably you heard of it, it's a very spectacular piece. And uh, it's a piece he worked on for more than two years with about a dozen workers. It's a tank completely crafted out of Italian leather. So he used the, the best calf leather, actually, to, to make this tank. He needed some, some spy work to be done. Like he infiltrated some people into an army base to measure the tank. That is actually not completely to scale. It's a little bit larger. And this tank skin, of course, is also a reference to, I mean, the Italian leather is a reference to all the luxury brands that have such a high status all over the world, but also in China. So he, he fabricated this tank uh, with the same care and with people who had the knowledge how to craft actually these haute couture brand bags that are sold in China and elsewhere. It's also interesting to know that most of the skilled workers now in Italy who, who do that job are from China. So they, they get taught by uh, local Italian people, but eventually they develop skills that are equal or even higher than the local artisan who, uh, that go back to traditions of several hundred years. So, 
two examples. The course of things is that Netco will uh, make a presentation about the contextualization of his work here in Unlimited. So we're going to have a, a nice common base for our joint discussion. I don't think that Netco needs a lot of introduction. He's probably one of the, of the most successful artists of the past 10 years, 20 years even, with uh, appearances in all important shows. He, he, he will show works that he has exhibited at the Venice Biennial uh, in 2007, but I think you participated even more than once, six times. Six times. And uh, he, he participated in most important biennials and is, is an important voice in contemporary art. Netko, please. Thank you. So shall we discuss first the, may I have the, these slides from, uh, uh, yes. Uh, the work dates uh, back from uh, 2010 uh, when uh, anyhow, as my galleries, uh, from Galleria Continua put it, you are in the area, which means China. Uh, since 2008, uh, I'm not flying. I'm really scared flying. And uh, then we went uh, for a project in Shanghai with my wife for two weeks by train, taking the Trans-Siberian. So the gallery say, if you are in the area, why not to make a project in our gallery in Beijing? So the project comes from there, and uh, when I was thinking what I could show is that uh, I am in a, a relatively unique position coming from a post-socialist country and trying to make a project in a country which, uh, at least on paper, is a socialist still one. And uh, hence uh, appeared that uh, story with, uh, I miss socialism, maybe. Uh, I, I guess you already know about these uh, nine Chinese characters. Hopefully there are not so many Chinese who say that something is a little wrong, so discussion should be a little bit on the left or put upside down. And they constitute the phrase, I miss socialism, maybe. On the top you have this uh, big brother size. And uh, there are 21 videos, which uh, uh, the reason for them, if, if I may read actually the text, which uh, originally in uh, China there was uh, this uh, handwritten text, which now you can take it from the boxes. So a part of my diverse artist production are these 21 videos spread among the giant comfortable cushions in the shape of nine and so on. So almost none of these videos are directly related to that theme. But what they do show is the confused inner world of a middle-aged man who still believes that a better world will come again. Uh, Originally, when the work was done, this is uh, uh, the shot is from uh, the night just before the, the opening. May I have the second one, please? Uh, Gianni really insisted, uh, please, uh, if possible, not so fast. Uh, Gianni Etzer really insisted that we should cover the cables. Uh, can, I, can I operate with this or not? Uh, so I uh, kind of uh, put my touch over the covers of the tables and I, uh, on the cables and I wrote the titles of uh, all of these videos which you already understood what for they are there. And uh, when it started functioning, the work, at the beginning I was kind of a little bit, I would say, shocked that nobody, especially at the VIP opening, nobody was really watching the video, videos. Everybody was, everybody was uh, either messaging uh, or relying uh, on, the, on the cushions uh, or even sleeping over the cushions. But uh, then I kind of realized that in a way it doesn't really matter what the people on these Chinese characters were doing. The Big Brother size, they were watching them. So really, from my artistic point of view, it doesn't matter what they do downstairs, it's still working. And uh, the thing which uh, I believe it's still working even more, that the people, they felt comfortable lying on these cushions without really realizing that they don't need to realize that they lie on something which says, I miss socialism maybe, even though we are kind of on a spot which uh, to, just to say the word socialism is a little bit of a heresy or something. So this is what I could tell about the, that particular work. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you first, what is your best memory from socialist times? Like something that you really cherish? Uh, 
the text which I just quoted, uh, the last part of it, it starts with this, that I don't miss socialism, I miss my youth. So basically I cherish my youth, which is a rather, <laughs> rather long moment. Uh, you know, uh, the kind of optimism, even though presumably you have the, like a very pessimistic view, but you expect something good and nice to happen, and now I'm still expecting something nice and again to happen, especially in my country, which uh, allegedly is the most corrupt and the poorest country from the entire European Union, Bulgaria. So I still expect something to happen, and uh, apparently it will not happen. And uh, what I'm trying to do with what I'm doing as an artist is just, uh, just to show some tiny little path to something which we may call, call hope or for a kind of a better world. I know that this one is a horrible cliche, but believe me, this is it. Actually, one of my favorite quotes are, is, you cannot miss your childhood because no, it no longer exists. Are you a romantic artist, like this kind of longing, you know, for something that no longer exists and that, that you will never be able to recreate? I'm sort of a romantic artist. Sometimes I like also a very sentimental one. Uh, the last time when I cried in front of an artwork, it was when I had the, on me it was like an extraordinary emotionally uh, charged moment. Uh, we were with my wife in Harlem Museum in, uh, uh, in Holland, in, Th in Tyler Museum in Harlem in Holland, where if you make an appointment with the curator, they could show you some of the original drawings they have so when you see Michelangelo, just like a 20 meters, 20 centimeters from your eyes, and you, you feel really extremely emotionally overwhelmed. The curator was rather impressed that this uh, big guy, like he's kind of crying in front of Michelangelo. And um, yeah, and I'm also sort of, sort of romantic one, but with a, a healthy dose, a dose of cynicism as well. Otherwise the romanticism doesn't work. <laughs> you. You opted for the word cynicism, but like maybe you could speak a little bit about how you use also humor and parody, maybe to a certain extent, in your work, and how this also is a way to undermine maybe the big feelings. You know that the drama can be also undermined by laughing and by uh, bringing in a certain lightness of life. Uh, humor is very important in my work, and I'm not saying that I'm kind of sitting and calculating, okay, now this one I'll make it sort of more funny to be more sexy for the people, more appealing, or the other one maybe not so funny. But it just goes by, by itself. On the other hand, we live in such times and such, uh, uh, how to say, uh, dumb times in a way, that if you don't have a sense of humor or you don't share it with the others, you are kind of completely lost. So it is, for me, it's very important. Since I graduated 81 in uh, uh, Sofia Art Academy, which was rather traditional one, very conservative, I've graduated mural painting. But I never really did murals, even though I meet pre pretty big one now with this uh, two eyes. And uh, I started uh, my career making some small paintings, and they have, all of them, they had stories in them. And most of these stories, they were funny. And uh, so it, it went step by step afterwards, the texts appeared and uh, some narrative installations, which part of them, they're really funny and some part of them, they're quite sad at the same time. Can you explain a little bit more about this tradition of murals in Bulgaria and like what kind of murals were they kind of related to, for example, Diego Rivera murals or the, the Mexican art history or like what kind of tradition were they based on? I mean, we have a tradition because it's an orthodox country and uh, we have like a numerous churches and uh, the frescoes, the, the frescoes which they still stay there in, part, in the best part of them, uh, they come from uh, 14, uh, 13, uh, 15th century. So you have like a long tradition of uh, like uh, making frescoes, for example. Not really stained glass, uh, not really mosaics, but especially frescoes, fresco seco, it's, it is like a traditional one. When I graduated the academy in 81 to be to graduate mural painting, it was really like a really top on the top. 
maybe because uh, there was uh, this celebration of 1,300 years anniversary of the establishment of the Bulgarian state, which was established in 681. And there were a lot of commissions, especially for monumental work and frescoes and this and that. So the profession of a muralist was something really extremely prestigious. Not anymore, no, since many years. I mean, here you use the wall in a sense like a mural. I mean, it has a very strong impact, a very strong presence. It, it's an interesting anecdote. When we uh, came, actually, when Netko came, he said, so, isn't it far too orange? And then uh, you spoke out for the first time. You said, I want a Chinese red. And in fact, it didn't look like a Chinese red. It looked like more like a blood orange or something. And eventually, we went to the Swiss paint shop and we found out that Chinese red here is called traffic red. And that's pretty much the same color. So we, we ended up with a traffic red. Which really worked. Actually, you can't really produce a Chinese red out of China. There is a, like a very special form of this extremely bright, bright red, which symbolizes yeah, communism, socialism. Uh, it's hard to be produced here. But I think with uh, also the necessary filters, we achieved uh, what it's good to have also relates to the to your the national flag, you know, the the, the cross, uh, in uh, the the Swiss one. But you produced a work for a show in Beijing for Galleria Continua. How were the reactions in Beijing, and like were they aware of the Chinese reds? How did I they think decide go, for the work in I general? I think it went by default about the Chinese red. The reactions, I mean, everybody was really watching very seriously, not really lying on the sofas. But maybe this was just for the opening. Afterwards, maybe they really kind of felt comfortable. For me, it's absolutely fine if the people, they lie and they like, kind of enjoy the softness of these sofas because they're nicely done, produced in, uh, produced in China. And... Uh, yeah, as I said before, uh, at the beginning I was a little bit shocked about what the people do on this, but unless they are doing something really not so appropriate stuff, it's, it's okay if they do whatever they want. And also watching the videos. You have invented a very interesting format that is quite unique by addition of different media in your installation. So there is this, uh, this element of the mural, there is the element of the writing that we had to reduce. I feel a bit like a, a totalitarian curator, but like in Unlimited, we keep the white walls white to give like this identity of an overall show and to create this unlimited identity. But you identity. have a lot of wall texts here and there. We have a lot By of wall way, texts, yeah. that's true. <laughs> and you have the installation with uh, the seats that you see from above. It was one of your wishes from the beginning that uh, viewers should be able to see and read from above the text. And you have kind of a retrospective. I mean, the 21 videos correspond to the 21 years in 2010 that you lived without socialism. Can you tell us more about the selection of videos, their origin and their content? Uh, the text, the whole work was done in uh, 2010, hence the 21 uh, videos, because between 89 and 2010 it was exactly this. Uh, as I'm saying uh, in the text, uh, they are not really related except for the two or three at uh, the very last ones. For example, the one which is called Nostalgia, and I'm looking at this very old uh, photo of mine when I'm looking much nicer with the hair, and uh, uh, I'm also thinner, much thinner. And then uh, I'm looking to myself, and I'm realizing that uh, Okay, I'm a successful international artist, but all of this look of me is maybe because of this uh, capitalistic uh, benefits or whatever. Uh, the first one dates from 1994. It's from a project called uh, The Superstitious Man, originally shown at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Skopje in Macedonia. Uh, North Macedonia, actually. This is the official name from yesterday of this uh, state. And uh, there are these four moons that you may see, and they are part of the installation which was uh, done in 1993 uh, uh, at Aperto, the last Aperto at the Venice Biennale. And uh, there are works which are also um, documentation of uh, existing uh, performances. For example, there are two films which they show uh, documentation from a live black and white. The performance, which is relatively well known, at me, there are two painters, one with black paint, the other with white paint, and they're constantly repainting the, that, the, the given space and exhibition following each other. 
for the entire duration of the show. So it's like a very diverse uh, situation. Some of them, they exist like a single pieces. Some of them, they're part of it. But I think all together, they kind of uh, work. The foremost, for example, they, the camera was taken uh, many years ago, just focusing on one uh, uh, crescent moon, which was part of a, of a painting. And it's kind of pulsating. So it gives a kind of a very, uh, how to say, very intimate uh, moment uh, besides of the, all of this uh, public uh, access to the, to the piece from many sides. Some of the videos are made in public space. That kind of mini performances that you do mostly without public, where you just perform for the camera. How is your awareness for public space? Like, how is it for you to stage such videos in public space? I remember one wonderful example, uh, the scene where you go actually from former ministry to former ministry, like to all these official buildings. Maybe you can tell us a little they bit more about They are not formal. They're, they're the real ones. They're the actual ministry, yeah, ministries. Yeah. So one of these videos uh, is called uh, Silent but as rich as only the Bulgarian language can be F words. And you can see that it's on a small monitor. I'm going in a really somber way and I'm appearing in front of the parliament and the camera uh, is uh, like, a, uh, like a, uh, showing my face when I very vigorously start cursing but without really doing, doing like this. I, I will make it for you. This is really rich, uh, which the English language really can't, can't do that. This is very self, uh, very self ironical because uh, as many Bulgarians, uh, I'm kind of murmuring constantly uh, about the government, whatever, but I'm not uh, taking uh, real steps instead of like um, criticizing it in my work, uh, artworks uh, to kind of change the society. I'm not voting, which is also not very democratic. I'm kind of against the government, but just not because there are not enough votes to, to fall down this. I prefer this my negative energy towards this government to be displayed in such kind of works. So I'm doing this one in front of the parliament, in front of the presidency, then in front of the uh, council of ministers and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, for me, it was absolutely fine. I mean, the people, they were not uh, looking at me. Somebody was filming me. What for? I mean, the people, they really there is another video which is called Destroyed Public Sculpture. And then uh, it is a, a sort of documentation of a performance which was done back in 2001 in the city of Arnheim during a, a exhibition, big exhibition called Sonsbeck with the permission of the widow of the sculpture, of the owners of that sculpture called Citizens, and the owners there, the police uh, headquarters in the city, and the city council and so on and so forth. Uh, one young artist, he made uh, a replica of one of the figures in that uh, sculptural composition representing citizens. He changed the replica with the, uh, with the original at the day of the opening, around like a nine o'clock in the morning, and afterwards with a really, really big hammer, he smashed, smashed that uh, uh, replica, but nobody was really knowing that it's a replica from the passers-by. And nobody really did anything from the passers-by. They were like, oh, but when it's in front of the police station, so maybe this is it. It's, it's OK if we just destroy that one. And the police officers, they were giggling from, uh, from above. So this was also a public uh, situation. And as you see, uh, the Dutch people there in Arkham, they didn't react at all. There's a long tradition of performance art in public space in, in socialist countries. I mean, in countries from former Yugoslavia, but also Czechoslovakia and so on. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of Yuri Kovanda. Do you relate in your work to this uh, rich tradition of uh, socialist performance and public performance? I wish I could say yes, or at least to say yes, I relate to the underground art which was in my country. Unfortunately, due to many reasons, but in Bulgaria there was no underground art, something which Yuri Kovanda, for example, did. Uh, in, uh, in Czechia, in Prague. Uh, of course, I relate with about uh, the sense of absurd. I think it exists in, uh, in my work. I could tell you, explain you a little bit another work, which is sort of performance, because in order to, uh, un to realize it, you have to do something yourself, the viewer. Just uh, a couple of months before the changes in 89, but nobody really knew that there would be any changes, on the roof terrace of the official union of artists in Sofia during the exhibition called The Earth and Sky, 
I placed a telescope pointing to the west. I guess you know what does it mean for East European country or the Eastern Bloc to say you look to the west. That means you look to the capitalism. And uh, so, but through the telescope, you can see the big red star on the top of the Central Committee of the Party, which is a very typical, this Stalinistic building. And they, so it's called View to the West. <laughs> to come back to the big brother, which is kind of the central figure of, of this installation, of course, nowadays there's another type of surveillance and there's not one big brother, but we, we, everything that we communicate is basically filtered or like even I read an article lately about public space and the control of public space with face recognition that you can track the movement of people almost everywhere and, and create a log of the presence of certain, of all people eventually that use public space. How much of, of that reality and maybe also that fear is contained in, in your work? Very much so. Very much so, and uh, if I may quote again the text from, uh, from the work uh, over there, I'm talking about uh, uh, I miss Big Brother size. Why? Because my friends and I dreamt about how nice it would be when Big Brother size would be gone forever. Yes, they are gone now, but they have been replaced by many more, even though not so big pairs of eyes following you as a citizen of a democratic country and trying to take things away from you that in the past belonged to Big Brother by default, but now you are supposed to deliver them voluntarily. And there is one piece uh, still at uh, the gallery section at the uh, Georg Argel uh, booth. Uh, it's called uh, Years, and they talk exactly about that situation, about this uh, surveillance. And uh, this surveillance is supposed to be very democratic, uh, and uh, very frankly, I don't see a very big difference between how it was before and how it is now. Uh, and we are not talking about ideology. The only thing we are talking now, it's about money. Shall we see some of these images that sure. we prepared? Good idea. Can we get uh, the third slideshow, please? So this was my, uh, can I say, or, or, or are you going to? This was my first narrative installation, so to speak. It was called New Noah Sark. It was presented uh, at the Istanbul Biennale uh, in uh, 92 and uh, got kind of a lot of attention. Thanks to this, I was in Aperto the next year and so on and so It's a story about Noah, who happened to be a very ordinary man living with his wife and two kids in a very common panel flat. And then suddenly one morning, in his bathroom appeared all of these strange, very strange creatures, and he was obliged to save them to another world, but without putting in the new Noah's Ark anything from the human's world. And our world was already at the end. Uh, what am I supposed to press in that one? Whoops, it's a little bit... Uh, Actually, there is a little bit of a confusion now with the, with the captions, but it's, but it's fine. So this is not Dreams Night. This is called Somewhere Under the Tree, and it was in 97. Uh, so just to, to let you know what I'm going to do with all of these images, I have a very diverse practice. In early 90s, it took me quite some time until, uh, like art people, they understand that this visual diversity might be a positive quality. So what I'm showing you now, it's a work from 97. It was at Dage Projects in New York. Uh, there is no really written story. And, but again, you are looking up what it's going actually underground. It was called Somewhere Under the Tree. And <laughs> now we're really jumping several works uh, ahead. This is a live black and white, uh, the performance I was talking about. And uh, uh, this is one of the, uh, in a way, the most uh, uh, successful uh, installments of the work in uh, 2001 uh, Venice Biennale curated by, by Harold Zeman. Uh, they painted for five months every day, constantly, sometimes a little bit uh, kind of not so regularly, but I uh, had to check them several times. On the other hand, the piece, uh, which is edition of five and one uh, AP, uh, one of the museums that has them, it's a Museum of, Contemporary, uh, Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt, so within the course of three years, the painters there, in three exhibitions, they painted all together eight months in a very serious German way. Uh, 
This is called Discussion Property from 2007, again from the Venice Biennale. It's a story about the absurd situation, the absurd uh, uh, discussion, to put it mildly, between Bulgaria and Russia, who has the right to produce the AK-47, the infamous assault rifle uh, called Kalashnikov. Bulgaria had the, not really the license, but as a part of the uh, so-called Warsaw Pact uh, during the, the socialism, we are producing AK-47 the same way as the Czechoslovakia did. But after the changes, after the democracy came, actually the Bulgarians, they continue doing this without giving any money to the, many monies to the Russians. And I was reading about that story and I was really very much uh, impressed. Uh, usually I can read about uh, uh, like a copyrights infringement, uh, about a book, about a musical score, uh, but never ever about the, the most uh, uh, like a deadly weapon in, in the world. And uh, then I tried to approach the two sides and to take their uh, kind of opinion about that and just to give me a short interview, which I totally failed uh, with that. Uh, only on the small monitor down on the floor, you have the director of the Bulgarian plant uh, who agreed to talk to me, basically saying me nothing for like 90 seconds. And on the left-hand side, uh, you have, uh, uh, I filmed the Russian embassy in Sofia, but from a parking lot uh, aside of the street, because again, they just didn't tell me that, uh, what I wanted to, uh, to ask them. And as a whole, there is this really long text, 15, uh, 15 minutes you need to, uh, to read it. Usually I have uh, texts which they tell the story, the main story, so to speak. And uh, that main story, it has to be really very well edited, otherwise the people will not stay and they will not uh, look at uh, the story. And this one basically explains my total failure as an investigative artist to, to reach these uh, two sides. And at the end, I'm having sort of a punchline, but why the Russians, they didn't pay, say? Three more minutes. After presentation, okay. So then I... And this is, uh, okay, just to see the space, it's called I Love Them. It's based on the seven of the movies which I really love. And uh, I made a special installation about uh, this. This is called uh, Good News, Bad News. Uh, different scenarios which uh, you have to really to, to squat uh, next to them and to, and to talk uh, and, and to see this. Uh, good news, bad news scenarios. This is called some nice things to enjoy while you're not making a living. It comes from Kunstmuseum Bonn and they're a very diverse uh, way of to enjoy life, uh, rolling on this uh, carpet, but uh, you have to know that there is this uh, big uh, white threads that they will stay on your, or on the left hand side, you see this enclosure, the black one, which if the the guard permits you, you can go inside because it's a soundproof and you can really shout as much as you want in order to take out uh, your burden or whatever. And uh, this is actually the main story, the reason to have uh, that uh, uh, big installation over there. I love, I miss socialism maybe. It's actually the work uh, which I've done during this uh, 14 uh, days trip from Sofia to to China. It's called uh, I Want Back Home, said the big frog. Maybe you have yes. to say that you traveled with a big plastic frog for like thousands of miles. Yeah, many, and, many. Yeah. And the frog is basically the main actor of, of the video. There was this Chinese frog, which I used it for a, uh, for a project in, uh, in New York. The project was called The Collector of Art. Somewhere in Africa lives a great black man who collects modern art from Europe and America, buying his Picasso for 23 coconuts, dot, dot, dot. So in order to create in his hut, which was just an idea of African hut, but inside there were original works by Andy Warhol, Rauschenberg, and so on and so, I had some plastic animals in order to create a kind of atmosphere. One of them was this Chinese frog. It's written made in China. So the frog was produced I think in Shanghai, then traveled to New York, I used it, it was sent to me to Sofia and I brought it back uh, to China so it actually circled the world. Here is the wall text which I'm trying all the time to, to quote uh, parts of it. To come back to our initial subject theme, like different histories, different futures, what is more relevant for you as an artist, as artistic material to work with and to work on? Is it the past or is it the future? Are you interested in the future at all? 
Of course, I'm interested in the future, and I'm constantly, because I'm very superstitious, constantly like a knock on notes, everything to be fine with my family and myself. Of course, I'm interested in the future, and in the past, uh, what I find is kind of sort of repetition which happens nowadays and maybe gives me a sort of hope that if I survive that thing, bad thing which happened in the past, maybe now when I sense it, it comes another one, maybe I will survive it again. So you're not a fatalist, but rather a... Mm, I'm kind of a... Yeah, I'm, I'm pessimist. Is, is it equal to the fatalist? Not, not really. Okay, I'm a little bit pessimistic in general, but this is just to be pessimistic in order not to scare destiny or faith. If you are too optimistic and you're giggling all the time and then suddenly something bad happens. So it's better to be kind of looking more darkly to the world. And if something uh, good happens, and maybe by inertia I still have this very somber face. <laughs> but, As a follow-up question, do we learn from history? We. Do we learn from history? Not really. Maybe because we don't know the entire history of certain, certain facts and certain situations. And uh, no, we don't really learn from history. Thank you very much. I think we're going to take two or three questions from the public. Do we have a microphone? OK. Hi, good afternoon. I have seen the uh, artwork in the show, and I would like to ask the question that what is your inspiration to use the sofa in Chinese? May I know that? Thank you. I mean, the inspiration was that I was in China, and <laughs> I thought it, it makes sense, uh, especially for the Chinese people, to the, because they could read it. There was also a possibility in that very space to see it from the same height as you can see it here from Daniel Buren's uh, top platform. So I thought that everybody could read it in China, that this one says, I miss socialism, maybe. That was the inspiration. And then I think that it also works uh, outside of China, because uh, the people, they don't, don't get it immediately that uh, there is a kind of Chinese character over there. And some of them, they think that this is just a comfortable cushion sitting there. But when you go on top and you read the text, then you realize that. But it's very simple. I was, I was in China. That's the inspiration. In German, to own is besitzen which means to sit on something. Basically, if you sit on it, you own it. And it's, <laughs> it's kind of a way to own something or to, to, yeah, to get activated by something or to agree with something by sitting down on it. Maybe one last question. Hi, I just wanted to know if you've read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, because maybe you're a cynic, not a pessimist. I wish I could say yes, but no. <laughs> Very frankly, I don't really read about uh, theory or something. I, I know that I may sound dumb or something, or especially when I kind of openly say that I don't uh, read this, and I never really get inspired by such kind of uh, theoretical writings. But I do get inspired by the stories of uh, daily life, and from movies, and from nature. Netko, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.